Almighty God says, My deeds are greater in number than the grains of sand on the beaches, and my wisdom surpasses all the sons of Solomon. Yet people merely think of me as a physician of little account, and an unknown teacher of man. So many believe in me, only that I might heal them. So many believe in me, only that I might use my powers to drive unclean spirits out from their bodies. And so many believe in me, simply that they might receive peace and joy from me. So many believe in me, only to demand from me greater material wealth. So many believe in me just to spend this life in peace and to be safe and sound in the world to come. So many believe in me to avoid the suffering of hell and to receive the blessings of heaven. So many believe in me only for temporary comfort, yet do not seek to gain anything in the world to come. When I brought down my fury upon man and seized all the joy and peace he once possessed, man became doubtful. When I gave unto man the suffering of hell and reclaimed the blessings of heaven, man's shame turned into anger. When man asked me to heal him, I paid him no heed and felt abhorrence toward him. Man departed from me to instead seek the way of evil medicine and sorcery. When I took away all that man had demanded from me, everyone disappeared without a trace. Thus I say that man has faith in me because I give too much grace, and there is far too much to gain. Amen. 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 When I read this passage before, I merely said that everything God says here is a fact, but I never truly understood it. I thought that since I'd believed in God for years, given up my job and family, expended myself suffering for my duty, when trials came, I wouldn't blame God or betray him. But when I went through a trial of sickness, I misunderstood and blamed God. My motivation to be blessed and to make deals with God was exposed to the light of day. Only then was I convinced God's words can expose people and my views on pursuing my faith underwent a change. One day in July, 2018, I found a small, hard lump on my left breast. I didn't think much of it and figured some anti-inflammatories would sort it out. But over the next two months, it just got worse and worse. I had night sweats and no energy, and the area around the lump was really hurting. I began to wonder whether there was really something wrong, but I consoled myself again, that it was no big deal. I had faith in God and was busy every day in the church doing my duty. I figured God would protect me. Then one night, I was woken by a sharp pain. Yellow fluid was leaking from my breast and I knew something was wrong. My husband rushed me to the hospital to get it checked. The results came back. They told me I had breast cancer. My heart skipped a beat when I heard the doctor say that. I thought, breast cancer? I'm barely 30 years old. How can this be? I just kept telling myself, no way. This could never happen to me. I'm a believer, and I've been doing my duty in the church for years. God will look after me and protect me. The doctor must have gotten it wrong. I just kept hoping it wasn't true. I don't even remember how I got home from the hospital. My husband saw this dazed look on my face, and he tried to comfort me. This is a small hospital, and the doctors aren't that skilled. They could be wrong. Let's get you checked again at a big hospital. I felt a little glimmer of hope when he suggested that to me. Unfortunately, the doctor at the big hospital confirmed it. It really was breast cancer. She also said that it was mid to late stage and that I had to be admitted for chemo and surgery. Otherwise, it could be terminal. I felt my mind just go totally blank and I felt my heart drop. And then I thought, how much is all this going to cost? What if I die halfway through chemo? How will my family 
cope with all that debt. They don't have money for these things. I was in despair, and I felt utterly helpless. After my first round of chemo, my whole body was racked with pain. I didn't want to do anything, and I was always groggy. It was only after the drugs finally wore off, a few days later, that I began to recover. I'd believed in God for years. I'd made sacrifices and expended myself. I always did my duty, through thick and thin. I never missed a gathering. I always helped my brothers and sisters with all of their problems. I had worked so hard, and for what? Why wasn't God protecting me? And now, I couldn't do any duty. I was practically at death's door. Did God want to eliminate me? I had five more rounds of chemo, and then an operation. How on earth was I going to cope? Apart from all the pain and suffering, if I died, would that mean all my years of faith had been a waste of time? That thought actually brought me to tears. I really was tormented during that time. I read God's words, but they didn't sink in, and I stopped praying. My spirit was so dark, and I was getting further and further from God. One day, Sister Lee from the church came to see me, and kindly asked me about my condition. Seeing me in such pain and feeling so down, she gave me fellowship. She said, God permits illness to befall us. And it is a kind of trial. We only have to pray and seek more. And God will surely lead us to understand his will. Hearing her say the word trial stirred my heart. Maybe God didn't want to eliminate me, but just wanted me to undergo this trial. After Sister Lee left, I went before God to pray and I said, Dear God, I've been living in pain ever since I got sick, misunderstanding and blaming you. Today, my sister helped remind me that this is just your trial for me. And yet, I still don't know how to get through this situation. Please guide me so that I may know your will. Amen. After that, I went before God and prayed to him the same way every day. And one day, I read these words of God. Entry into trials leaves you without love or faith. You lack prayer and are unable to sing hymns. And without realizing it, in the midst of this, you come to know yourself. God has many means of perfecting man. He employs all manner of environments to deal with the corrupt disposition of man and uses various things to lay man bare. In one regard, he deals with man. In another, he lays man bare. And in another, he reveals man, digging out and revealing the mysteries in the depths of man's heart and showing man his nature by revealing many of his states. God perfects man through many methods, through revelation, through dealing with man, through man's refinement and chastisement so that man may know that God is practical. Amen. 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 As I pondered God's words, I finally began to understand his will. God works in the last days to perfect people by exposing our corrupt dispositions through all kinds of situations and by using the judgment and revelations of his words to make us understand our satanic dispositions. We must seek and practice the truth so our corrupt dispositions are cleansed and changed. I understood that God had allowed me to get sick, and it wasn't to eliminate me, or to try to hurt me on purpose, but to cleanse and to change me. Yes. Mm -hmm. I couldn't misunderstand God or wallow in self-pity anymore. I had to submit to seek the truth in my sickness and reflect on and know myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Once I'd understood God's will, I no longer felt so dejected or in such pain. I said a prayer of submission to God. And once I'd finished, some of God's words came to mind. Your pursuit is only to live in comfort. 
for no accidents to befall your family, for the wind to pass you by, for your face to be untouched by grit. I looked it up in my book of God's words, and I found this passage. You hope that your faith in God will not entail any challenges, or tribulations, or the slightest hardship. You always pursue those things that are worthless, and you attach no value to life. Instead, putting your own extravagant thoughts before the truth, you are so worthless. What you pursue is to be able to gain peace after believing in God, for your children to be free from illness, for your husband to have a good job, for your son to find a good wife, for your daughter to find a decent husband, for your oxen and horses to plow the land well, for a year of good weather for your crops. This is what you seek. Your pursuit is only to live in comfort, for no accidents to befall your family, for the winds to pass you by, for your face to be untouched by grit, for your family's crops to not be flooded, for you to be unaffected by any disaster, to live in God's embrace, to live in a cozy nest. A coward such as you, who always pursues the flesh, do you have a heart? Do you have a spirit? If you continue to experience in this way, will you not acquire nothing? The true way has been given to you, but whether or not you can ultimately gain it depends on your own personal pursuit. God's words precisely exposed my desire to be blessed in my faith. I thought back over my years of faith. At home when all was well, I was healthy and everything was good. I'd engaged in my duty, and I seemed to have endless energy. But once I got cancer, I became negative and I misunderstood and blamed God for not protecting me. I capitalized on the work I'd done and argued with God. I even regretted all my years of sacrifice. I lived in a state of shunning and betraying God. When I was refined and exposed by illness, I saw that I hadn't been doing my duty in making sacrifices to pursue the truth or do the duty of a created being. I'd only done things to get peace and blessings. I'd been making deals with God to be blessed in return for the sacrifices that I had made. I wanted everything in this life and eternal life in the next. But now I had cancer. I was going to die and I wouldn't be blessed. I blamed God for being unjust. I had no humanity at all. I thought over my years of faith. With so much grace and so many blessings from God, I had been watered and sustained so often by the truth. God had given me so much, but I never thought of repaying his love. And when I got sick, I didn't submit to God at all. I just misunderstood and blamed him. I was totally without conscience or sense. Yeah. I finally understood that God had allowed me to get sick, to expose and cleanse my motivation to be blessed in my faith and my wrong views on pursuit. So I'd focus on pursuing the truth and seek a change in my disposition. Mm, that's, that's, right. that's right. I felt such deep regret and reproached myself after I understood God's good intentions. I silently made this resolution. Whether I get better or not, I won't make any more senseless demands of God. I just want to put my life and death in God's hands and submit to his arrangements. Amen. Amen. I felt so much calmer after resolving that. I wasn't as anxious or distressed anymore, and I could quiet myself to read God's words, to pray and seek with God. Uh -huh. Thanks be to God. Once I had submitted, going back to have chemo wasn't as painful as it had been before. Though I still felt a bit nauseous, everything was much easier. The other patients were surprised and envious. I knew in my heart that this was entirely God's mercy and protection. Amen. I felt so grateful. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. After several rounds of chemo, the egg-sized tumor had gotten significantly smaller. It didn't hurt as much, and there wasn't any oozing. The doctor said my recovery was going well, and that if things carried on like that, then after six rounds of chemo, I may not need an operation. 
I was so happy to hear that wonderful news. I kept thanking God. My faith in God grew and grew. And I thought that if I reflected and really tried to know myself, then perhaps I could get better without an operation. One day in March, I had my last chemo. I was both nervous and also hopeful. And when it was over, the doctor said I still needed to have the operation and then two more rounds of chemo and then some radiotherapy. My heart, it just dropped into my stomach and my mind was buzzing. I thought, how could this be? I've reflected like I should and understood what I should. Why haven't I gotten better? It's a major operation and besides the scarring, the chemo and radiotherapy that I'll need will be so painful and there's still a chance that I could die. I felt more and more unhappy and my whole body went limp. I began to cry at the injustice of it all. The night after my operation, once the anesthetic had worn off, the pain from the incision was so bad I cried. I couldn't even take a deep breath. I just felt so helpless and wronged. And I began to blame God again. It was too much for me. When would the pain finally end? And then, as I was suffering, I read these words of God. For all people, refinement is excruciating and very difficult to accept. Yet it is during refinement that God makes plain his righteous disposition to man and makes public his requirements for man and provides more enlightenment and more actual pruning and dealing. Through the comparison between the facts and the truth, he gives man a greater knowledge of himself and the truth and gives man a greater understanding of God's will, thus allowing man to have a truer and purer love of God. Such are God's aims in carrying out refinement. All the work that God does in man has its own aims and significance. God does not do meaningless work, and nor does he do work that is without benefit to man. Refinement does not mean removing people from before God, and nor does it mean destroying them in hell. Rather, it means changing man's disposition during refinement, changing his intentions, his old views, changing his love for God, and changing his whole life. Refinement is a real test of man and a form of real training and only during refinement can his love serve its inherent function. Amen. Amen. Every one of God's words entered my heart, and I felt very moved. And right then I knew that God's will in refining me this way was to get me to develop true self-knowledge so I could seek the truth and cleanse myself of my corrupt dispositions. Mm. Before, although I realized I shouldn't pursue blessings in my faith, I hadn't fully let go of my motivation to be blessed. I was still harboring extravagant demands of God in my heart. I thought, as I reflected on myself and came to know myself, then God would take my sickness away. My self-reflection and self-knowledge were actually tainted with personal motives. They were just covers for my desire to make a deal with God. I hadn't truly repented at all. Yeah. God had scrutinized my thoughts and used my sickness to expose me, to make me reflect on myself further and truly repent. This was God's love for me. Afterward, I prayed to God saying, Dear God, now I understand your will. I wish to forego all personal choices and requests and seek the truth in the situation you've arranged. Please guide me. Amen. Amen. A few days later, I read this in God's words. When people begin to believe in God, which of them does not have their own aims, motivations, and ambitions? Even though one part of them 
believes in the existence of God and has seen the existence of God, their belief in God still contains those motivations. And their ultimate aim in believing in God is to receive his blessings and the things they want. Every person constantly makes such calculations within their heart. And they make demands of God which bear their motivations, ambitions, and a transactional mentality. This is to say, in his heart, man is constantly testing God, constantly devising plans about God, constantly arguing the case for his own individual end with God, and trying to extract a statement from God, seeing whether or not God can give him what he wants. At the same time as pursuing God, man does not treat God as God. Man has always tried to make deals with God, ceaselessly making demands of him and even pressing him at every step, trying to take a mile after being given an inch. At the same time as trying to make deals with God, man also argues with him. And there are even people who, when trials befall them, or they find themselves in certain situations, often become weak, passive, and slack in their work and full of complaints about God. From the time when man first began to believe in God, he has considered God to be a cornucopia, a Swiss army knife. And he has considered himself to be God's greatest creditor. As if trying to get blessings and promises from God were his inherent right and obligation. While God's responsibility were to protect and care for man and to provide for him, such is the basic understanding of belief in God, of all those who believe in God. And such is their deepest understanding of the concept of belief in God. From the substance of man's nature to his subjective pursuit, there is nothing that relates to the fear of God. Man's aim in believing in God could not possibly have anything to do with the worship of God. That is to say, Man has never considered, nor understood that belief in God requires fearing and worshipping God. In light of such conditions, man's substance is obvious. What is this substance? It is that man's heart is malicious, harbors treachery and deceit, does not love fairness and righteousness, and that which is positive, and it is contemptible and greedy. Man's heart could not be more closed to God. He has not given it to God at all. God has never seen man's true heart, nor has he ever been worshipped by man. I felt so ashamed when I read this. God's words revealed my true state exactly. I'd believed in God for so many years, and had always wanted to be blessed, always making deals with God. I felt that since I believed in God and had always done my duty and expended myself in the church, God should look after me and protect me and keep me from all sickness and harm. I thought this was only right and proper. When I found out I had cancer, I immediately started to complain to God and wanted to capitalize on my years of suffering and sacrifice to argue with him. When I began to get better, I said, thank you, God, with my mouth, but in my heart, I wanted even more. I wanted God to take my sickness away entirely so I wouldn't have to suffer anymore. When my extravagant desire wasn't satisfied, my devilish nature returned. So again I blamed God and tried to argue with him. My behavior was exactly as God reveals in his words. Those without humanity are incapable of truly loving God. When the environment is safe and secure, or there are profits to be made, they are totally obedient toward God. But once that which they desire is compromised or finally refuted, they immediately revolt. Even in the space of just one night, they may go from a smiling, kind-hearted person to an ugly-looking and ferocious killer, suddenly treating their benefactor of yesterday as their mortal enemy, without rhyme or reason. I was just so crushed. Though I'd believed in God for years, I wasn't worshipping or submitting to him like I should. Instead, I was treating him like a powerful doctor, like a refuge, 
I was using God to achieve my own ends, trying to get peace in this life and future blessings from Him. Yeah. I saw that my faith in God had been nothing but barefaced deal-making, and I'd been using God to get grace and blessings from Him. Hadn't I just been cheating and resisting God? I saw just how selfish and deceitful I was without a shred of humanity, living out nothing but satanic dispositions, how God must have loathed and hated me. And then I read this in God's words. Job did not talk of trades with God and made no requests or demands of God. His praising of God's name was because of the great power and authority of God in ruling all things, and it was not dependent on whether he gained blessings or was struck by disaster. He believed that regardless of whether God blesses people or brings disaster upon them, God's power and authority will not change. And thus, regardless of a person's circumstances, God's name should be praised. That man is blessed by God is because of God's sovereignty. And when disaster befalls man, so too, it is because of God's sovereignty. God's power and authority rule over and arrange everything about man. The vagaries of man's fortune are the manifestation of God's power and authority. And regardless of one's viewpoint, God's name should be praised. This is what Job experienced and came to know during the years of his life. All of Job's thoughts and actions reached the ears of God and arrived before God and were seen as important by God. God cherished this knowledge of Job and treasured Job for having such a heart. This heart awaited God's command always and in all places, and no matter what the time or place, it welcomed whatever befell him. Job made no demands of God. What he demanded of himself was to wait for, accept, face and obey all of the arrangements that came from God. Job believed this to be his duty, and it was precisely what was wanted by God. Amen. 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 I felt so moved as I contemplated God's words. I thought God is the creator. God can bestow grace and blessings on us, and he can judge, chastise, trial, and refine us. Couldn't God give us trials just because he loves us? That's mm -hmm. right. I thought of Job. God bestowed great wealth on him, and he thanked and praised God, but he didn't covet material wealth. When God took everything from him, he could still extol God's name through his trial, saying, Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? Amen. Job knew that everything he had came from God and that God was righteous whether God gave or took things away. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Job's faith in God was not tainted by personal motives and he gave no thought to whether he'd be blessed or meet with disaster. He didn't complain, no matter what God did. He was able to take his place as a created being, to worship and submit to God. Seeing Job's humanity and reason, I really felt ashamed. I looked at everything I had. God had given it to me, even my very breath. And yet, I hadn't been grateful at all. Instead, I blamed God when I got sick. I had no conscience or reason whatsoever. I believed in God, but didn't know him. And I didn't really know my proper place before him or how I should submit to the Creator. Believing in God with my notions, imaginings, and ideas about making deals, I complained to God, and I resisted Him in the face of trials. Even so, I always wanted blessings and grace from God and wanted to get into God's kingdom. I truly knew no shame. I saw that even if I died right then, it would be God's righteousness for my rebelliousness and corruption. I found the path of practice in the experiences of Job. No matter how
how long I would be sick for or whether I got better or not, I wished only to submit to God's rule and arrangements. This was the reason I should have as a created being. Amen. Amen. This thought brought me a great sense of release. It was time for radiotherapy before I knew it. The other cancer patient said radiotherapy was really hard on the body, that it would basically cook my flesh. They said I'd get dizzy and nauseous every time, and I wouldn't be able to taste anything. When I heard all this, I started asking God to help me escape the situation again. But I quickly realized that my state was wrong and prayed to God. Some lines from a hymn of God's words then came to mind. Since you were created, you should obey the Lord that created you, for you are inherently without dominion over yourself and have no ability to control your own destiny. Since you are a person who believes in God, you should seek holiness and change. Amen. Amen. I knew that this situation was God testing me, and I couldn't senselessly ask God for things or hurt him anymore. I knew I had to submit to his arrangements. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Once I had submitted, although I had to have radiotherapy every day and my body hurt in places, it wasn't as bad as the other patients had told me it was. I knew this was God mercifully taking care of me. That's yeah. right. When I'd finished my radiotherapy, my physical recovery was really fast. I looked and felt really good. My brothers and sisters in the church said I didn't look like a cancer patient at all. Then after a while, I started doing my duty again. Ah, oh, thanks be to God. My faith in God grew through this, and I began to cherish Amen. having the opportunity to do my duty even more. Oh, man, Amen. That's great. It's been almost two years since then, but whenever I think back to those ten months when I was sick, it feels like it happened only yesterday. Although my flesh suffered a little, I came to understand my motivation for blessings and my mistaken views on what to pursue. I know now that I have to pursue the truth and seek to obey God in my faith. Whether I am blessed or I meet with disaster, I must always submit to God's orchestrations Amen. Amen. and His rule and arrangements. This is the sense of reason a created being should possess. I could never have gained all this if life had gone smoothly. This is the wealth of life God has given me. Amen. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank Almighty Amen. God. Amen. What a great experience. That was really a life